So welcome to How to Yu-Gi-Oh! Tips and Tricks Part 10 Deck Building So in this video I'm going to be talking about deck building and the tips and tricks that I've discovered myself in regards of deck building I'll be talking about um, PCR Positive Card Relationships and NCR Negative Card Relationships I'll be talking about these two things later on in this video and give me examples of how these two skills can help you in creating good deck building skills in order for you to become one step closer to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh! Master. Okay, with that being said, let's continue on with the rest of this video. So first, I'm going to talk about positive card relationships and give some examples for them let's go okay so now let me show you an example of positive card relationships working in motion so how does this work let's the effect of runic fountain is as follows you can activate one runic quick play spell from your hand during your opponent's turn once per turn if you activate uh Runic Quick Play Spell card, you can target up to three Runic Quick Play Spells in your graveyard, place them on the bottom of your deck in any order. Then draw the same number of cards. Alrighty, so let's go. So we would first activate Runic Tip. Activate its um, secondary effect, a special summon from the extra deck to, we'll go that to the graveyard, I'm sure you can't see that. Two special Hagin. Right? Hagin would then discard our runic quick play, which would be destruction, to add ourselves a, field, a runic field spell, which would be another fountain. Right? And here's where we can see positive card relationships taking place. With the effect of fountain, since we activated a quick play, we can target up to two, up to three, so two of these, put them to the bottom of the deck, right? Okay, we will do that to then draw two. And these are the two cards that we draw, which are Runic Freezing Curses and Fusion Destiny. All right? All righty. So then we would normal summon Synchro Fusionist. Now... Let us show you again how we can implement and how we can go even further with positive card relationships. We will then activate Ready Fusion, right? Paying a thousand, okay? This allows us to special summon a level six fusion monster or lower that's non-effect, which would be our vein, okay? We would then link these two off and make Sprite Elf. Right, which is here. So I'll just move it there, Sprite Elf, move it there. Okay, okay. We will then uh, just change that. We'll activate the effect of Elf, revive back our vein. Okay. Um, we will then synchro summon into Cupid the effect of Synchro Fusionist. Right, would activate. Since Synchro Fusionist has been used as a Synchro Summon, I can add any card from my deck that lists Fusion or Polymerization when it's used for a Synchro Summon. And so here's where we would add uh, a lovely, reliable, as you can see there at the bottom of the screen, Super Polymerization. So let us stop there and observe. So with the ability of obviously positive card relationships, you can use this to build advantage in your hand and just go from strength to strength. Let me give you more examples of how we can fully utilize positive card relationships in a deck. And here I show a completed board. Now, why is this important? This is to show you how we can use positive card relationships again to be a bit more responsive. When we understand how card effects work, we can use them in conjunction in order to activate another card's effect. Remember, the sole purpose of positive card relationships boils down to a simple sentence like this. Mastering positive card relationships mean, means that you can use 
one card's activation condition to activate another. So activation conditions can be activated by another card's effect activating. This is important and this, as this can give you abilities to do things that you couldn't do before. So for example, we have Sword Soul Grandmaster Xi Zhao, which is right here. Okay? Right? Grandmaster Sword Soul Xi Zhao is its effect is that it can banish a worm monster from my hand or graveyard, as we can see here, the graveyard is a bit uh, spicy there, in order to negate a card. Then we have here uh, Virtual World so, virtual world gate chuchi now its effect is you can target uh, one face-up boss on the field shuffle two of your banned virtual cards with different names from each into the deck then destroy that card and currently we have one card banished which is virtual world gate king long so what do we do here and how do we activate the effect of chuchi on our opponent's turn when the opponent activates a monster effect, let's say on the field, we can activate the effect of Qi Zhao and banish um, Zhi Zhi from our graveyard. This fulfills, the, this fulfills the need of negating a key monster effect on the field and puts our virtual world gate Chu Chi live. So in one effect, we have essentially activated, we've essentially set up the activation condition for another. This is, this is an example of how you use activation conditions to help you uh, help you go further in your deck playing and in, in your, no, sorry, your deck construction and in your strategy when playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Mastering the relationships of cards and mastering the positive effects that, cards ef that card effects have on each other can make you into a Yu-Gi-Oh! master, so bear this in mind. Okay. Let me give you another example of how we can use this um, positive card relationships to our benefit as well. Okay, let's go. Okay, and let's look at the final example of a positive card relationships taking place. So we have the effect of Regulus right, right here, which we discard, which we discard, we discarded with branded opening in order to special. Aluba, the Jest of Despia, as you see there in defense position. It's allowed us when it's special summoned to act to add branded fusion, right? Okay. As we can see with Regulus's effect, is that when it um you need to target a machine in your grave in order to special summon it, equip it to it, and it becomes an omni negate. So we had we had activated Therion this Colosseum in order to add ourselves uh, another Therion King Regulus. And this is how we can use positive card relationships to help us. So we can turn a minus into a plus with just two cards, which was branded opening and th turn this Colosseum, right? And we happen to draw branded lost. We can turn just two, these two cards into something meaningful. And so now with the special summon of that, obviously we've added branded fusion. We can then activate uh, Therion King Regular, special summon it, targeting that and equipping it to that, meaning that we now have an Omni Negate and it is boosted because it is a targeting uh, Therion monster. So we have that. So we have an Omni Negate. We have Branded Fusion that we can activate. And here, as you can see, is that here's an advanced solution to a problem that you have. So you didn't have like a negation to protect yourself. Now you do. With the ability of using positive card relationships, or rather using positive effects to help you, you can use it to be defensive as well um, in starting in your combos. And this is very important. This is very important indeed. Mastering the positive effects of cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! is crucial in order to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh! master, my fellow students. It is absolutely crucial. This is the final step that you need. And as they are positive uh, card relationships, they're also the negative ones. Okay, this is this is something that I will showcase in the next half of this video. But this is very important. As you can see here, we've done something quite special with only two cards. Understanding the positive effects that cards have on each other can allow you to create unique combos and unique strategies in your deck 
deck building that you didn't have before. This is the start of you becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh master in a sense of creating strategies that are not only foolproof, but in creating your own combos, your own strategies, and your own ways of playing the game and seeing things in your own ways and allowing your own ideas to flourish. Remember, it's not about doing the wrong thing. It's about doing the wrong thing in your own way. That's the way I see it anyway. No idea is a bad idea. And if you can master this philosophy, if you can master the positive uh, uh, card effects that cards have and use them in conjunction with each other, if you can think in terms of using one's uh, activation condition of one card to, acti to facilitate the activation condition of another with these examples that I've shown here, you truly will become a Yu-Gi-Oh master and it will be the final step for you to becoming a great Yu-Gi-Oh player. Okay, that's all I've got to say. Let's move on. Okay, and now that I finish talking about positive card relationships, I will now follow this on by giving examples of negative card relationships. Okay, and so now we're going to talk about negative card relationships. So as you can see here, we're talking about aliens. As you can see, this is not an ideal board. This is an example of when we have a archetype or a deck that doesn't synergize with each other and no effects connect with one another. So no, so no effect of that you see on the board creates an activation condition to activate another card. For example, the effect of a cell recombination device, which was sent with Foolish Burial Goods, only activates on the next turn, so not on this turn. And with such cards like these, we can see how uh, negative card relationships can be detrimental to deck building. But it can also be a good thing, especially when you want to, when you want to stop your opponent's uh, positive, uh, you know, positive effects that happen on their side of the field. Understanding negative card relationships can help you to deal with them and can help you to create negative card relationships on your opponent's side of the board, especially when you're doing. That's what it's all about. So obviously I've showcased you here um, a typical example of, you know, negative card relationships. Let's continue with this. Okay, and here we have a second example of negative card relationships. You look at this board and this does, and you say, this doesn't look too bad. This looks all right. We have Sky Iris here, which can pop a uh, Odai's Pendulum Dragon, meaning that we could add any Odai's cards, we can add a scale one. The effect of um, Odai's Arc Pendulum Dragon would activate, special summoning an Odai's monster from the deck. And it, it looks pretty good. But what you fail to realize is, is that we need to do a lot of things. There is nothing that, while Sky Iris to Odd Eyes is a positive card relationship as it allows you to activate the effect of Odd Eyes Arc Pendulum, we don't go further from here. As we've used, as the effect of Performer Pal Sculptor by Joker has been used already to set, to activate that and add that onto the board. So we see here how we nothing is building up on anything and nothing is uh, doing anything. Sure, we could go into a pendulum summon, but what uh, board are we making? What are we doing here? We're not making anything substantial here. We're not making anything threatening here. And this is an example of negative uh, card relationships in action. Negative card relationships, when they're placed in a deck or are in a deck, is is it does the opposite it creates subpar boards and creates subpar dueling it's the sort of boards that don't really mean anything they don't do anything and it really doesn't help in uh, deck building at all and it's one of the things that you need to avoid doing unless you're making a as they say you know a casual deck then that's fine but on the flip side Negative card relationships teaches us a very important lesson. The, the lesson that it teaches us is that if you can uh, commit 
to having your opponent do more having more negative card relationships in their deck if you can understand the card effects that exist in the game that produce negative card relationships for your opponent that, that produce a negativity then your likelihood of winning increases this is why we use hand traps and why we use such sort of things as this increases our chances of winning but more more often than not this is where the 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 term you know side decking comes in as we are implementing more negative uh, card relationships to our opponent and allowing them to not facilitate their strategies that they would do when they would have a great hand or a really broken hand. So it is important to understand that negative card relationships are just as important as positive card relationships. Understanding how to use them, how to apply them, can help you and make you to become a better Yu-Gi-Oh player. But most importantly, it takes you one step closer to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh master. Okay, and now that you have a rough idea about positive card relationships, and negative card relationships, how does this, I'm sure your question that you're asking, refer to deck building? Well, deck building is about using card, is, is using the skills of positive and negative card relationships to make your deck to be as consistent and as strong as possible. Being able to master positive card relationships and understanding what they are and how to use them and how to create them or find them can give you the skills not just in deck building but in playing the game it can elevate you to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh master understanding how um, car cards positively interact with each other understanding these relationships can help you see things that you couldn't see before this really helps in deck building for example, as I showed in the uh, PCR, Positive Card Relationship part of this video, I showed some very uh, simple examples of how effective use of positive card relationships can just transform simple interactions into full-blown strategies, you know? I also showed with Mastery of Negative Card Relationships how obviously it, it showcases how, you know, Cards are affected ne negatively, but how you can negatively impact your opponent. How you can stop them building uh, great boards if you understand what uh, the effects that they do not like to occur on their turn. Understanding negative card relationships is equally as important. As they say, if you know your enemy, you know yourself. And indeed, negative card relationships are some of the relationships that cards have in Yu-Gi-Oh that you need to master as well. Mastering both positive and negative card relationships will get take you, as I keep saying, one step closer to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh master. So deck building revolves around these two um, uh, strategies, as I like to call it, and one of the things that I've mastered greatly. That's one thing I'm, I can say I'm very proud of. I may not be a... Uh, you know, a skilled, you know, player at the game. But when it comes to building decks, I won't say I'm second to none, but I would call myself, you know, a good deck builder and able to find, uh, you know, ways to make interesting decks and interesting strategies because of this simple reason. Understanding how cards positively and negatively affect each other, understanding these relationships, understanding the environment of the game and how all these things works, being able to find good cards quickly and spotting bad cards quickly is a skill in itself that can help you in creating good decks, uh, creating bad decks as well. Knowing how to make a good deck is just as important of a skill as knowing how to make a bad deck. Making a good deck really good is, is very important. It's the same as making a bad deck bad. Now you might uh, question and say like, what's the difference? Well, when you make a bad deck bad, and you know why a deck is bad, for example, you can reverse this, and you can use this to help you create better side deck cards for when you face the meta in the future. And you also understand 
while your deck is bad. So you can then apply this when facing your opponent at high level tournaments and understanding what they need, for example, to make themselves bad. I'll give an example of an archetype that we're going to be getting real soon, and it's going to be getting support, really. I think you know this, Cash Terra. Now, Cash Terra, obviously, uh, coming up in Fortune Hypernova, it's getting support, and it's very, very strong. Um, extremely strong, and people consider it broken. But when you know the positive card relationships that it has, and how it implements them, for example, let's look at all the Cash Terra monsters as a whole, and let me give you a summary of all the effects so all of them all of the cash main uh, main monsters have the claws and all of them except the new support that comes before tonight but over just our original support all state that to activate the effects yeah you, they have to be pro they, can, they have to be proactive meaning that your opponent has to activate a monster effect and then they activate it in response so for example with cash Terra fenrir for you to banish uh Face up card your opponent's out of field. Your opponent has to activate a monster effect, and then you act and you only can activate a uh, an effect with Kestra Fenrir in response to your opponent's monster effect activation. If they activate a spell or trap, it will not apply. And then it has its other effect that it can search any other Kestra monster, including itself. Balance is made to be broken. We have Kestra Unicorn that has the same clause again. It can respond by, you guessed it, when your opponent activates the monster effect, it can it will activate, you can activate its effect in response, because it can only activate its effect when your opponent activates a monster effect. It can only act When nothing ruins the game plan. So its effect will be is that when uh, your opponent activates a monster effect, in response to this, after the effect has resolved, like with Fenrir, you can look at the extra deck and banish one card from the extra deck face down, whatever you choose. I like it. Its other effect is you can search any cash Terra spell in your deck. There are no limits to the power of this card. And then we have Kashtura Ogre. Like before, it has that clause that states if your opponent activates a monster effect, you can activate an effect in response to the effect to your opponent's monster effects resolution. So they have to have finished activating the monster effect only for you to activate your monster effect in response. Similar to the other Kashtura monsters. And its other effect is is that and so its effect on response is that you can excavate five cards from the top of your opponent's deck and banish one of them and return them back the and return back the cards the four cards that you banished in the same uh, four cards back into your opponent's deck in the same order that you excavated them wait a minute that can't be right and finally its uh, other effect is that once per turn you can search a cash to your trap that's really convenient now why is this important as you can see, these effects are strong and they're reactive. But here's the thing: we know that they're reactive, and they're react. We know that they're reactive, and knowing that they're reactive is important. Is that if we know now to stop them from activating, is we just don't need to be activating monster effects. We can go a step further. For example, all Castile monsters, special summon themselves. You know, if you don't control any uh, monsters. So the other wording is so the other thing that we can do now is if we put a monster on your opponent's out of the field, would they be able to spread some of the monsters now? Obviously, this is just a plain example, but you can see how understanding the positive card relationships of cards and their negative card relationships can help us to find a strategy and a way to easily deal with cash terror and able to not be overwhelmed and to be um, just out of your depth in dealing with new uh, new strategies or new decks that show overwhelming power. This is the skills and the advantages of, an, of understanding positive card relationships and negative card relationships. And with that, that's all I've got to say in this video. Hopefully this has helped you understanding um, positive card relationships and negative card relationships. And this will help you, hopefully, I hope, to become better players and to take one step closer to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh master. Hope to see you soon. We come to the end of this video. So, as I like to say, you are one step closer to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh master. My fate, right, is in your hands.